Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Good, good evening. Depending where you are. Right. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Ross. Welcome. Hey, Mon. How are you doing? Good. Good morning, Mon. Morning, everyone. I haven't seen Alex join yet, but oh, there is Alex. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um. Shruti and I were just on another OCP call, so I want to give Shruti a moment to join, and then we'll um, review the agenda and get started. I think she's already here. And here she is. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. So um, I think I've met everybody on the phone, just looking through names, but this is Alex Raykow. Um, I lead sustainability for the data center segment at Schneider Electric, and I'm uh, co-leading the sustainability project for OCP with Mohan. Um, and I think Shruti included uh, the agenda for today's call and the invite. Um, so we've got a few things to go through. Since this is our last uh, meeting of the year, Mohan is going to uh, give some wrap up on sort of what we accomplished in 2023, um, and, and turn our attention toward 2024. And then Shruti can share some of the new work streams that we have established for 2024 um, and give some exciting information on kind of what we hope to accomplish and what we're already building momentum for. But before we get to those items, um, we have Rolf Brink up first um, from the Immersion Cooling Project at OCP. Um, he's going to speak to us about what that project has undertaken and how we in the sustainability project may be able to add value to what they're doing, um, or at least, you know, provide our feedback on that work. Um, is Rolf on the phone? Yes, I am. Hello, Rolf. Um, are you ready to, to take the, 
the mic. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and uh, share my screen. Thanks uh, for joining us. Absolutely. Very welcome. Sustainability is uh, is very dear to our uh, very near to our hearts uh, in in immersion. So. Um, okay. We had the pleasure of uh, of hosting uh, Shruti uh, uh, last month with uh, an update on uh, sustainability work. So it's uh, uh, it's great to do this uh, the other way around as well. After her uh, fantastic uh, uh, insights that she was able to share. Uh, oh, hang on, let me switch on my camera as well so you guys can see who I am. Um, many of you will uh, will will. Uh, may recognize me uh, from the various summits um, uh, immersion uh, as part of the cooling environments project and has really taken off over the past year so uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what immersion actually is what and what we're doing with with our projects and especially uh, how we are looking at sustainability um, I gotta skim over this uh, a little bit uh, because I'm not, I don't want to make this a very technical session, but uh, immersion cooling, um, if you're not familiar with the technology, um, there's a couple of key points around it. Uh, uh, that we need to differentiate between uh, generic liquid cooling, uh, cold plate cooling, and, uh, and indirect liquid cooling, like uh, with door heat exchanges. Um, uh, liquid cooling in general is just a practice of using a liquid to extract heat from components uh, as opposed to air, whereas immersion cooling is looking at the full submersion of electronics within a dielectric fluid. Um, and there's a couple of different types of immersion uh, deployment, single phase and two phase. Those are the most, no, most notable ones. Single phase, uh, meaning that the, there's, we're working with low volatile fluids, typically oil-like oil substances, uh, which, uh, which do not evaporate, uh, which, uh, which remain in the liquid form, uh, have very high evaporation points, high flash points, uh, that sort of things. Uh, whereas whereas two-phase is extracting heat by design, by, uh, by means of changing its phase from liquid to gas. Right, That is a process, a physics process, which... Uh, uh, which is very effective in absorbing heat uh, from its environment. Um, there's a couple of different type, different implementation types that we're working with, open bath and closed chassis and uh, hybrids, which we haven't seen much yet, but we are expecting more of that. Um, open bath uh, doesn't refer to uh, to a lid on to lids or no lids. Uh, it refers to an open-to-air interface above the immersion fluid. And so these are typical tank-style systems, um, and they uh, they can be either single-phase or two-phase technologies. But as soon as you have a shared volume of fluid uh, between multiple pieces of IT equipment, that's but you're pretty much talking about open bath systems. Whereas enclosed chassis, also known or referred to as clamshell designs, uh, are chassis that are sealed and liquid proof um, uh, and they contain either a single or maybe two pieces of IT equipment but typically a single and that's typically rack based uh, which is very similar to uh, air cooled racks as we know them. Uh, hybrid systems uh, can be combinations. Um, uh, there's a broader definition for hybrid, which where we can also look at the combination with cold plates. Uh, but let's not get into too many details. Here's a couple of uh, viewpoints. So um, I'm sure that if you guys have walked around Summit, you've seen some of this, uh, uh, some of these systems uh, being displayed. Uh, various types of open bath systems, but also enclosed chassis systems, both single and two-phase uh, uh, demonstrations, which you're probably familiar with. Now, why is this all very important in the industry at the moment? Uh, it's because the efficiency that immersion cooling brings. Uh, so similar to, uh, uh, similar to other liquid cooling technologies, uh, immersion brings uh, uh, capabilities of high uh, temperature operation uh, and operating at elevated temperatures means that you can reduce your uh, your cooling 
power, you, could, you couldn't capacity over your facility simply because you can utilize more of the ambient air temperatures to uh, to cool. So you can work with dry coolers instead of uh, compression chillers, which are very energy intense. There's a, a simplified infrastructure. Moving liquid around a facility is a lot simpler than moving air around, contrary to what most people might intuitively think. Um, liquid is very easy to maintain. Uh, we do it all over the world with uh, uh, with the water pipes. If you open your tap at home, uh, that water is ending in your sink or in your glass instead of uh, in the ground or in your basement, if you've done things well. right? So water is, is a very common type of infrastructure that is being deployed. So there is a couple of drivers that necessitate liquid cooling in the industry and that relates obviously to the increase in computational demands uh we're all familiar with the ever increasing power envelope of chips uh where the heat uh, that is being accumulated on spot on on the chip surface uh, keeps going up chips need to get bigger as well to get rid of that heat and uh one type of chip which is uh in which is particularly high on power demand is the accelerator type chip. Then we're talking about GPUs and open accelerator infrastructure uh, as as is being uh, worked on within open compute uh, and FPGAs. Um, and these have very high thermal densities and these are driving up power requirements and, uh, and and power densities of computer chassis or server chassis, uh, which makes them a lot more challenging to cool these days uh, with air in the traditional way. Uh, and I think every server manufacturer has already announced by now that future uh, revisions of their equipment with the latest chips or with the highest density chips will require liquid cooling in one way or another. Uh, so that means that uh, the industry is being forced into liquid cooling and immersion cooling is one of the cooling strategies that is going to be essential for the future ecosystem and, and data centers. And this helps drive uh, some of the sustainability goals in the industry, reducing greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And one uh, aspect in particular is enabling heat use. This is something that every liquid cooling company in the world is focused on that is advertising on why because they're all passionate about it of course but also uh, because there is a very good technical reason for it because we're working we can work with much higher temperatures yeah? so bringing fluid to the chips around, allows that fluid to be um, at a higher temperature than what we might have been used to in the past uh, which means that the return temperature or the waste heat is of a higher temperature, which makes it a lot more valuable or uh, and valorizes that type of waste heat for potential reuse. Um, and obviously, we're also looking at regulatory aspects globally, uh, uh, which are take, which are being implemented to force sustainability. And this is where liquid cooling is uh, again for the for both technical and uh, commercial reasons uh, very attractive. Um, but immersion in particular is facing some is still facing some major challenges. It's uh, it's not a hypothetical technology anymore. It's uh, it's a technology that is proved that has been proven uh, by now, um, and all the vendors and all the chip manufacturers are working on their immersion support uh, uh, strategies at this point in time. But there is. Immersion as a technology still needs to overtake a couple of major obstacles in the market. One of them is standardization. Um, there is no standardization yet between uh, solution vendors, uh, between different technologies. Um, fluids are not standardized. Tank designs are not standardized yet. Uh, there are no harmonized maintenance principles or procedures. Uh, how to how to extract servers, how to clean servers or maintain server systems that is still uh, that still needs to be well documented and implemented in terms of standards and, uh, and the best practices. Um, and there is no clear visibility on the actual server lifetime uh, and how to deal with upgrades and replacements, right? Um, another aspect is related to total cost of ownership, um, which is uh, for a lot of end users, not yet very transparent. It's 
because it requires a way of work that's different for people are used to, it's difficult to assess how the TCO is going to be affected for it for a particular end user. Uh, reliability information is not yet fully available simply because we haven't had millions of systems that have been immersed for years that allow us to do some data mining on their reliability. And this is stuff that needs to happen that's part of a scaling industry. Um, but these kind of things need to be uh, need to grow organically. And that is what is happening now. Um, Obviously, one of the recent discussions over the past year have been focused on PFAS that has related that relates to the two-phase fluids, which are uh, fluorochemicals. Um, that uh, uh, and PFAS has been uh, a discussion because all these fluorochemicals are PFAS fluids. Um, this is why there is a lot of uh, turbulence in the two-phase uh, immersion domain at this point in time. Uh, we're waiting for new formula formulated fluids when they were waiting for new fluid types which might which might replace the current uh, PFAS fluids um, and these are struggles that this uh, this industry is undergoing uh, currently we're working hard on vendor support and warranty and one of the big uh, I see that the um, uh, there was an image over it but one of the notable challenges for the industry that's no different from cold plate um, that cold, what cold plate has already gone through is the fact that the entire ecosystem consists of uh, startup companies which are tremendously difficult to scale um, uh, suffering for star from staffing shortages so I may be painting here a very negative picture but this is exactly why we are here with OCP. We're here to support this global transition and to help this entire industry with scaling up, with meeting all these uh, all these challenges and resolving them. And we're backed by a, a lot of very good people, very good supporters, strong supporters, uh, companies like uh, like Intel who make a serious impact on this ecosystem uh, and our providing a serious support in, in the advancement of this ecosystem. Uh, Verda, Schneider Electric, uh, server platform OEMs, all the all these solution vendors, we're all working together in the immersion project to help progress this by sharing, uh, collaborating, uh, facilitating adoption, uh, creating publication specs and best practices. And as a project, we are supporting this. Uh, we are also embracing the strategic focus on recognizing the challenges. So there's a reason why I've put so much emphasis on, on what is in the way of immersion, because for us, it's critical to have a very good understanding of what we need to tackle as a project. And this is where we've established the Immersion Challenges Workstream. And this workstream is actively seeking out reasons why not to embrace immersion so that we can address and mitigate these challenges. So new workstreams are created from these from this Challenges Workstream. And these new workstreams are specifically focused at tackling very specific hurdles. And as a result, we have become one of the biggest project, if not the biggest project within Open Compute, with the amount of work scenes that we're supporting, we've literally just kicked off a new one this week focused on uh, fluid life cycle management. There are more to come out in the next year. Uh, so I'm, I've, we've got a pretty good lineup of other topics that, we're, that are going to be uh, focused on in the upcoming year in 2024. So we may be looking at three or four more work streams that, that, that are going to be kicked off. Uh, and furthermore, we're even looking at, comp at a complete restructuring of the community to help with uh, the scaling of this community by itself. Right now, we're looking at about 500 active members in the immersion community alone, which is massive which is absolutely impressive. And a lot of that is driven by the adoption and support of some of the notable uh, OCP member organizations as well. And every one of the members in the community has a very strong affinity with the sustainability topic. And this is something that I can um, attest to myself from a personal perspective as well. Everybody in this community that you will ever speak to is focused on is looking at heat reuse is looking at efficiency because they're in it for uh with that with that uh, sustainability angle um 
it is very often the driving force behind the creation of companies or the driving force behind individuals to work for the companies that they work for. Uh, immersion is a very high efficient solution, which is uh, which is which has an immense effect on the overall power usage. It's not just saving energy on the facility side, but also on the IT equipment side. And therefore, it's an essential part of a, of a larger ecosystem of liquid cooling solutions, right? This is why we're also grouped together within the cooling environment, uh, together with the door heat exchanges, cold plate and immersion, but also, which I've, which I've not mentioned here, advanced cooling facilities, where the facilities are, where facility designs are uh, created, but also uh, heat reuse, because all of these technologies are intricately involved with uh, with heat reuse projects. Now, carbon footprint or is also a very high uh, uh, is very often mentioned within the immersion project. And right now, there's a handful of work streams that are looking at the carbon footprint. First of all, the new one that we kicked off this week. Uh, has in its uh, in its charter described as well that they want to be looking at the carbon reduction for fluids, um, but also the TCO workstream uh, we flagged carbon accounting and CUE as KPIs to build into the TCO model uh, upcoming year. Um, and within the immersion cooling challenges workstream, uh, carbon reduction is very regular to uh, very um, uh, regularly discussed. But we do have uh, some bigger fish to fry at this point in time, and that mostly relates to technical uh, standardization and some of the uh, meeting some of the industry challenges that are laid out for us. Uh, but carbon footprint is very high in the second place. But before we can effectively tackle that, we need to ensure that this uh, that immersion is. Uh, properly facilitated in the market. Um, there is a lot more information that can be found on the wiki. We have a well, very well up-to-date and well-maintained wiki page for the Immersion Project, uh, which contains a complete contributions overview. I was planning to, to, to include some here, but I decided against it due to time constraints. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, the wiki gives all the access to all the work products and uh, the previous calls that uh, that we have had within the project. Next week is going to be our year-end community call, uh, where we're going to be providing a full overview of every work team that we have uh, and a debrief from every work team that we have. It's, it's a bit like speed dating. It, uh, it gives a, a quick insight in every uh, activity and, and what people are uh, currently doing and, and pursuing and which work products they're currently working on. So I do recommend joining that. Uh, and for now, I uh, wish you guys uh, <laughs> very happy holidays and, uh, and a fantastic uh, uh, year end. Um, and I'm open to any questions that you might have. Hey, hey Alfie, New York. Uh, this is Mohan. I have two Hi, questions. One question and a comment, and the comment can wait if you if you're able to stay for uh, my session. Uh, so the question was on on slide five when you are presenting the immersion advantages. You said no chillers and so on. That that's assuming that you are essentially using all the heat for some other recovery, right? You're you're doing heat recovery from there. Uh, it refers to the fact that you don't need uh, compression uh, compression cooling uh, in most areas. Uh, so free air cooling is uh, is is what most uh, immersion installations are are looking for, are looking at. Uh, does that res and I respect that it's not properly represented on the slide. Uh, uh, I've used this slide from one of the other work streams, uh, but yeah, I do agree. Uh, there is no such thing as no cooling at all. Uh, but yes, in a heat reuse scenario, you would not need to cool. And obviously, when it comes to uh, 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 high temperature operation, the aim is that you can be uh, can operate without the compression cooling or the chillers, as we know. Does that, uh, does that answer your question, uh, Man? Yeah. Yeah. So my, yeah, my th my thought was right. In, in if you're gonna do immersion at scale, uh, uh, you know you're a you know hundreds of megawatts or gigawatt type data center, you're you're once again just like AF cooling. You're gonna be at the mercy of the environment. Right, what the ambient temperature. Correct. Is. 
right? There is going to be there are months there are months where even with uh, evaporative cooling they do resort to uh, refrigerative cooling uh, to hide by their summer. So you're going to have the same issue here as well. It's not unless you're doing heat recovery all the time. Correct. No, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, but like I said, the aim with liquid cooling in general, especially when when combining technologies effectively, uh, like, uh, for example, combining core plate and immersion, uh, and it's, that, that's how you can drive the operational temperatures uh, so far up that you can, in most areas, uh, effectively eliminate uh, compression cooling, hopefully. But yeah, uh, there is a realistic side to it, which means that, yeah, you're always going to need some kind of cooling. And yes, if you if your platform cannot handle it, or if you can't, if, if, as long as the, the, the industry is not there yet, where we can do these um, these very high temperatures routinely, yeah, we're still going to be working with chillers. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Shruti, I think you had your hand up first. Yeah, um, so quick question, because you were mentioning that uh, carbon reduction for these fluids is discussed quite often. So I was, I was wondering about the measurement of, you know, carbon impact of these fluids. Are there standard methods that exist for the carbon assessment of these fluids? This is exactly what this new work stream is going to be looking at. Uh, so uh, this, this fluid life cycle, the fluid life cycle work stream is going to be looking at, hey, uh, how do we assess life cycle? And they've also taken in uh, carbon uh, assessment in that proposal. So we literally just approved it this week. Uh, we have no visibility on any materials yet because they haven't kicked off yet. So they're going to be kicking off in January. Okay, but sort of standardizing how the carbon assessment is done, is, is that a part of this work stream that you said? It may, it may very well be. So th this, is going to be, uh, th this is going to be established in the next couple of months. Uh, they're going to be refining the scope. Uh, honestly, um, like I said uh, in, in, during, during the overview, we've got some very high priorities to deal with the, uh, first. Uh, and for us, carbon accounting is, is, is a very high priority, but it's still a nice to have because, hey, if you don't have an industry to scale, uh, there's not much use in doing carbon accounting if there's no proper, no scalable deployment. So it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg. Uh, but yes, there, there's going to be a focus on carbon accounting in the upcoming year. What it's going to look like, I don't know yet. Sounds good. Thank you. Kofi, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, I I, uh, I I I like to build on what Mohan said. Um, I mean, Mohan, I my understanding is that eventually you guys decide. I mean, will be instrumental of deciding whether we can live without chillers because if your chips you need seventeen degrees, if, even with immersion cooling, we're gonna need chillers. If you can live with fifty fifty five degrees Celsius, of course. 50, 50, 50, 55 degrees, I mean, rough, but, but we all agree that probably yeah. we can just use yeah. drier coolers. So it's it's up to you. Oh, the bullet's in your court. We, 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 we can just put you outside and let it, let you breathe. That's it. <laughs> 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 no, no, no fans needed anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I, it's a, it's not us guys. It's it's our customers and what kind of performance they want, right? It's, sure, it's it's, it's, yeah. it's always someone else. <laughs> no, no. So so yeah. Again, I Great don't want to say this into Yeah, I think we we, we have a variety of uh, a variety of uh, rise temperatures, uh, right? And then the inlet ends up deciding what kind of cooling we can get away with, right? If if the inlet is low enough and people are okay with the Lower rise, then yeah, absolutely, You're right, Cosmo. You can you can lower that. But you know, folks want uh, very high performance, then then you, you end up with uh, uh, you know, high cooling needs. Okay, so uh, I think that's that's me next, Ralph. Okay. Yeah, uh, you had your hand up, and you're already okay, talking. Good. So please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, so uh, I, I wanted this to be for other folks too. Uh, one of the projects that actually I was I was going to talk about. We talked about this. At, uh, in mid-year, but we never got around to uh, initiating this was uh, essentially identifying the impact of fluids, not just from a carbon standpoint, but from an environmental impact standpoint, 
uh, right? So, I mean, I'm not talking about single phase. Single phase is mostly hydrocarbons, but there are some fluorocarbons there. And most of the two phase liquids, Ralph, you, you and I had this session with a few others at OCP. Uh, and uh, we wanted to see if there is like a, a work stream that needed to be started. And given all the other priorities, we never got around to. And the goal was to go create metrics, right? If it's GWP or whatever the right metric is, and also to measure with those metrics what the number is. Because uh, as you know, some folks report GWP on a 100 year basis, some folks report it on a you know, 50 year basis, and there is variations there. And uh, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on having that kind of a work stream. Uh, it, did, it doesn't matter to us whether it's in liquid cooling or whether it's in sustainability. The only reason we thought, I mean, we're all adults here, I'll just say it out loud, right? The only reason we thought we should it should be in sustainability is because in your organization, there is a lot of petrochemical companies. So I, I don't know how fair a treatment it would receive over there. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Um, uh, let me just first say that also to the, to the rest of the audience, uh, uh, Moana, because I do want to compliment you and especially your whole team uh, with this report. Your team in particular is giving to not just immersion, but liquid cooling in general, right? But uh, we're, not, we're feeling a lot of that in immersion. Uh, Intel has published uh, a fluid specification, which we've embraced and adopted within Open Compute, which also focuses on quite a lot of sustainability aspects to uh, the immersion fluids, which We've, we've, which we've very well received. Um, so I just want to th 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 thank you for, for all that support that you're giving and uh, all the references that I gave in terms of uh, uh, strong supporters. Um, uh, Intel is definitely on the top of that list, right? So um, I like and I, I genuinely love the idea of a joint project i th i think that when it, uh, if we look if we would be looking at a sustainability project for the immersion fluids in general um it would have to be a collaboration uh, between uh, uh, bet between the sustainability absolutely. project and immersion right so absolutely 100% agree on that we're currently uh, in a complete restructure exercise for the immersion project where we're going to be looking at methods in which we can best work together with other projects because sustainability is not the only project that we need to engage and interface with. Uh, we also need to work together closely with uh, mobile data centers, server projects, uh, the, uh, the Open Accelerator Initiative, uh, and, and many more uh, projects which are very which are getting more and more uh, engagements with, uh, with immersion. And we need to cater to that. Um, Part of that restructuring is finding a way to to set up a proper interface model with other projects, and uh, I would like to um, invite you guys in in helping us assess what the best way is. And I completely appreciate what you said as well in terms of uh, giving it a fair treatment. I agree that if it's a sustainability focus, the sustainability project would have. Uh, should have a very strong influence or a strong leading role in that. Um, so yeah, let's have that conversation, and I would love to get you guys involved uh, rather sooner than later uh, in the restructuring input session as well. So next month uh, there's going to be a community engagement session session for that to collect inputs on what people want to expect from the immersion project. And I'm going to be doing the same with other uh, projects within OCP. So that is something that I'll be reaching out for. But in this, uh, for this example in particular, yeah, let's let's have the conversation and put this on the on our roadmap for uh, for one of the work streams for upcoming year. Okay, thank you. I, I want a sort of further discussion between us if you want a combined work stream. Uh, sorry, can you just repeat it? I couldn't understand. I couldn't hear you well. Note that to hold a further discussion between us, including Mohan and Alex, uh, if we want a combined work stream for them. Yeah. Okay. And let's have that. Uh, I'll, I'll get you guys invited in, uh, in one of the next uh, Emergency Theory Committee uh, uh, meetings where we're together with, the whole, with all of the leadership. So we'll, we'll, we'll coordinate this and we'll set it up. Uh, Jeroen, you had a question as well. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just uh, want to point you at the uh, a, a diagram I put in the chat. This is a research by Gartner 
about the priorities of uh, CEOs, CFOs, and sustainability. As you can see, it's mentioned, uh, but it's very low on the on the list. And I had this same I, uh, reference or idea when I heard you talk about yeah, we you know sustainability is important for us, but we're also mainly focusing on these, for example, these broad blockers. Right? How can we get people to adopt or take away barriers to adoption of liquid cooling, etc. Um, yeah. And my thought was, Correct. I think, I'm not sure if sustainability is actually a separate topic. I think if we can find ways to... No, it's make... not. I, I agree with that. And every work stream has sustainability as part of their scope and part of their charter. Right. So oh, it, it I... totally makes sense what you're saying. It, yeah, I, I, I tell a story internally at OCP about you know, in the 70s, they had uh, in the US, you know, they had this, um, you know, energy crisis, right, with the oil prices and so on. And the kind of follow on uh, to that uh, ended up to be a lot of interesting things. One of them was we came, you know, government came with very weak regulation. And essentially, the industry said, you know, what, that's not good enough. And they redefined it. Uh, they redefined KPIs, they redefined what these metrics should be and so on similar to what we're doing, right? Uh, the government then said, okay, yeah, we can use these. And uh, they they put some weak, um, you know, kind of guidelines and, and, you know, aspirational goals together. But the amazing thing that happened is that, um, you know, you know, efficiency, I won't say sustainable, efficiency was monetized by the market. And so uh, when it was monetized by the market, now, the high end of the market is, you know, for the high efficiency equipment. And that's the hottest part of the market right now, right? So uh, I, I think that some of this yeah, awareness is, is important, uh, but I think some of it is inevitable. I think the market actually will, will shift our concerns to, you know, new opportunities. And a lot of these opportunities exist in a sustainable, you know, manner. So that could come in different domains. It doesn't have to be all, you know, efficiency. It, it could be many other areas. But I think this is a uh, this is uh, the market will help out here. Is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I, and I agree with that as well, right? So in terms of, uh, but uh, your own uh, the what you mentioned, I, I I love the way you brought it up as well. Like, hey, it's it's part of everything and, and that I can I can attest to it this is exactly how every work stream is shaped within the emotion but every work stream is talking about uh, carbon is talking about efficiency is talking about some kind of sustainability angle uh, as a sustainability is literally in 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 the foundation but I do feel that we could benefit from uh, some eyes over our shoulders every now and then. Um, maybe that's that's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, to 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 do a little bit more every now and then, uh, hand in hand with the sustainability project. And I I feel that this is the case. This can be the case for all the liquid cooling uh, groups within cooling environments. And Cosimo, it is probably more for you than for me, since you're one of the new uh, cooling environments uh, leads. But I think that. Uh, there is uh, a broader play here for sustainability as uh, as an entity within open compute to have a little bit more uh, potential oversight, maybe call it that. I think per personally that sustainability now plays a role on essentially everything from chip manufacturing to 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 batteries to generators. I mean, it's everywhere. We We cannot... <laughs> Avoid a sustainability conversation, including cooling environments. I agree with you, Rolf. And I just want to be, uh, you know, mindful because we do have, you know, another few items on the agenda. Uh, Rolf, thank you so much. That was a very insightful presentation, and thank you for taking the time. I can see that a lot of our audience is very interested. So hopefully, we'll have something. Uh, followed up after this also, but I'll let you go ahead, Alex. Let you go ahead with not being muted. Yeah, <laughs> next item yeah. on the agenda is back to Mohan. Um, yeah. Mohan, if you would, just to give um, 
your yeah. analysis on what it is we accomplished in 2023, where we are with the work streams and, and to tee up 2024. <clears throat> all right okay so, it's, it's so i just wanted to walk through all the uh sustainability projects and again uh to be fair to all the work stream leads and the folks that have participated this is uh, uh this represents five months of work uh so this we only set these goals in july when we got together and put together these work streams and uh, started driving towards some accomplishments. Uh, so what the one of the work streams that's been in progress is uh, carbon modeling. The, uh, the goal that we set for ourselves was that we were able to deliver um, an API that allows various models to query this, uh, the embodied carbon footprint. Uh, I don't believe, I, Deb, you're on the call. Uh, so Deb is the lead of this uh, work stream. I don't believe we got to getting an API, but we have a white paper published on this topic and we have a collaboration with iMasons to go work on it. So uh, probably, uh, I don't know Deb, how you would grade it. I'll let you talk to it. Right, we struggle for not having software resources to um, actually implement an API that, you know, software is, 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 you know, a good quality software API. So that would be number one, we never found those resources. And then number two, we are struggling to um, get information that could, that the, you know, that the API could query and pull up um, you know, and exposed to people. So we have data problem and implementation problem. So, but we do have a white paper. So, um, and we are um, into a bunch of analysis of examples and just to make sure that our concepts hold. That's where we are. So we'll carry forward the API goal into 24. Uh, but, you know, we made some progress on 23. Towards getting there. Is that a good way to characterize this work stream? I would just, I would also add that we are, um, we've only been doing embodied carbon, and next year we're going, and the goal is for 24, right? 23 is over. Um, little typo. Um, we will be adding also operational. Um, Carbon modeling. Right, yeah, just, just embodied. Uh, oh, yeah, the, if you see the scope, it's all embodied carbon. That's the hard one to get because operational, anybody can go measure it with their physical access to, to the hardware. Embodied carbon is hard to find out. I would uh, disagree on that. <laughs> I think there's a lot of complexity in the dynamic carbon of energy usage, for example. Uh, wait, wait till, give me. Two more slides, I will get there. Yes, okay. This, yeah, we do have another extreme on that. The, uh, what I'm saying is that, the, so I don't want to turn this into a technical session, but operational carbon, you have some means, you can debate on whether the means are 100% perfect or not. But embodied carbon, you have no means except analysis today. That, that's, the, that's the gap that this was supposed to go fill. Uh, the, the only means that they have is uh, published data from folks like IMEC, which is purely uh, statistical, not real. Okay, so, and then on the sustainability metrics uh, work stream, uh, it, the goal was that there is a lot of these metrics and uh, the, the question is, how do, you, how do you measure them, report them in a consistent fashion, right? So, and this is not a new struggle. This has been a struggle for the last decade. Uh, even the United States government actually published something on this on how to measure this. Uh, so we wanted to a come up with some, some profile that says, you know, here's how OCP sees this. Uh, and given that everybody's PUE is nowadays 1.0 something, uh, so what's the next thing, right? And uh, our thought process was we, we needed to come up with a new efficiency metric 
and there is a proposal for that metric called infrastructure utilization efficiency. Uh, so, and given that PUE, WE came from Green Grid, uh, we didn't want to do this in isolation. What our profiles we set, we also needed to align with them. I believe, uh, so again, Sammy's on the call. I'll let you speak to it, Sammy, but I believe the white paper is going to get published uh, this week. Uh, IUE, we have a proposal. You talk to it at uh, OCP, but uh, uh, the profiles are not going to be done in 23. Is that fair? That will be carried forward to 24. That's right. I think uh, we started in the middle of the year. We made good progress, uh, but we need to continue to work on it. Uh, to the reach the final goal. Can I can I um, point out? Oh, sorry. A, yeah, go ahead. Sir. There's an EU standards effort going on. They're asking for input into regulations, exactly on the topic that you're talking about. So PUE, WOE, UE, etc. In the link or in the chat, I put a link to my input. Oh, um, I think if people here or maybe as a group or individual could contribute there, I think that would be uh, useful output for the sustainability projects. No, we'll, no, thank you very much. We'll go, we'll go tackle this. This is perfect. Yeah, we found we found the folks that work on it on US government and and, and Asia, but we're not we didn't know about we couldn't find the one on Europe. Thank you. This is perfect. We'll go talk to them. Sammy, anything else on your ass assessment here? Yeah, I think that's correct. I think uh, we are trying to get this uh, paper published uh, uh, for end of this year. Uh, so we will get that dropped out to end of this week. Um, we made a good progress uh, on a lot of discussions and we you know, presented the uh, what need to be changed. We are fine tuning it. There's fine tune on IUE is going to have been happening next year. And we want to capture what is done on PEE side. And we want to really call out uh, the gaps that work need to be done there. Okay. And I believe next year we want to uh, integrate the uh, telemetry work that is going on to enable the metrics. We will uh, work with the telemetry team and combine the metrics that we are defining and make sure that uh, that gets uh, all aligned there too. And we need to find a green red rep because there is some there is some uh, legal issues to overcome as well here. Okay, uh, I think it was Yaron that was mentioning the power telemetry. So absolutely, the don't see Danny on the call. Danny leads this work stream. Um, the goal here was measurement of power is crucial and. I believe uh, the, the the goal was to deliver an OCP power profile, uh, but I see John and Jeff Order on the call. Is the OCP power profile in manageability now called power? How power comes from the platform? Just a question for John. Yeah, either John Leong or Jeff Order. They're both on the call, I think. Mm -hmm. Beware. Sorry, Moha. Uh, yeah, that, so, so to remember, Jeff, that there was a request to you and John Leong to make the uh, if uh, the power profile a mandatory uh, thing on the plat on the server platform to say how power is uh, server platform power is exposed mm -hmm. to your Redfish profiles. I'm just asking if since Danny is not here, I'm just asking you oh. if you know. If, Oh yeah. Well, actually, in the in the existing profiles, uh, I think it was. I think it's been mandatory since since the since the start. Uh, I'll pull it up and verify. But but certainly going forward, at least the you know any any new profile that we create would would will absolutely have uh, you know both power and and I expect to also put energy on that list uh, as a yeah. It was it was an if implemented and it. Give it had there was wiggle room and that you you are going to close and that that's what I was asking for. Anyway, so uh, you're on that was the answer to your question, right? One of the number one issues is, uh, I mean, we have an 
ongoing joke at Sustainability Project that what power are you, what's the power your system is consuming is the easiest question with the hardest answer, uh, right? So, and it shouldn't be. And the, one of the goals of this telemetry project was to push a profile. And one of the profiles was uh, in the hardware management project to make some of these things mandatory. And the remaining power knobs, I believe, are still under work. Uh, so this will get carried forward as well uh, to next year. Uh, Danny had an even later start than everybody else. He didn't start till uh, September or so. So, yeah. Well, the, the reason why I say this is, in my view, more important is that the embedded carbon is a done deal, right? It's water under the bridge. You're not going to change that. But yes, here, right. you have a chance to optimize, to make the system more sustainable as you go through these APIs. So this is where you can make the difference. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay. It's it's under your control. It's totally under your uh, the control of whoever the user is. And, and Mohan, just to just to verify that that yes, the existing server profile uh, requires uh, power consumption as a measure. Awesome, awesome, perfect. So we can take a partial done on this one. Uh, and then last, this is the one that I was referring to in the conversation with Ralph. Uh, this. We debated whether we should have it, but I love Ralph's idea of uh, having this work stream be something that we start and jointly own across immersion uh, and uh, sustainability. And this is essentially putting metrics on environmental safety and and uh, having a having a specification that that talks to uh, how that impact is going to be measured. So I mean, again, this was uh, this was never started because we had a where does where is the right home for this, and uh, and I'm glad that in in the last minutes of 23's discussion we got a we found a joint home for this project. And there's a few more that we kicked off that was post uh, OCP Global Summit, and I'm going to let Shruti talk to them. So overall, uh, thanks. I mean, first of all, uh, uh, those of you that are in the software come from the software world. Uh, so you can see Intel is a factory, the way we go about managing projects. Uh, apologies for that, but uh, the, uh, the, the, but you know, it's good to, good to know where we stand. So I, I think we have made some progress, not as much as we would have liked to have, but we can, we should put, you know, put some energy and speed into 24 to, uh, to get these things done. Thank you, Mohan. Shruti, do you have this slide pulled up for the work streams or would you like me to share? Well, I can share the slide. Yep, looks great. <sighs> oh, no. I can talk through it. I think me and Alex are both in, in sync here. <laughs> Oh, um, if you want, um, I can do the second one if you want to do the first one. Yeah, actually, yeah, that would be good. Um, okay. It would be great if you talk about the second one. So we uh, are actually having two new work streams uh, that will kick off in 2024, um, as per our plan right now. The first one here is carbon accounting for circularity. And this will essentially just kicking off. Uh, there used to be a circularity uh, work stream previously, and uh, we're sort of trying to Create circularity itself as a sub project because there can be multiple, you know, task items underneath. So under that circularity, this is a new work stream starting carbon accounting for circularity. And of course, one of the reasons is uh, one of the major goals is so that it can develop the guidelines such that carbon benefit can be accounted for whenever such activity is undertaken, like reuse or recycle, or if there is a different kind of carbon act uh, capture activity. Um, so that is some of the main focus of this particular work stream. And like we discussed a little while before, uh, uh, I think, Jeron, you were bringing up, we sort of need to incentivize um, market and parties in order to do the reuse, recycle. So there has to be more guideline on how they can get the benefit of carbon when they are undertaking some of these activities. And that guideline sort of doesn't exist right now. So that's the focus here. Um, our co-leads for this are John Michael Hans, who was also the co-lead when circularity workstream used to, was functional previously. 
and Ari from Seagate. I think Ari is on call also. Um, I don't know, Ari, do you want to add two words or something to this? And I want also want to thank our co-leads for uh, volunteering to take this up, please. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of um I've, I spoke to this at OCP as well. Uh you know, carbon accounting is is difficult. Um in in storage for example, there's there's often um you know, different aspects depending on whether you're hard drive vendor or SSD vendor and that goes across the whole board and you know, our goal isn't to compete one one, one technology over another because they all have their place. Um, but to but to look at things, especially embodied carbon, but also also you know carbon throughout the life cycle through through the end of life. Um, there's a huge focus here on on cir on circularity um, because reuse. Uh, you know today 100 you know 100 over 100 million drives a year are just being shredded. Most have usable life left, and that's that's only thinking of HDDs, SSDs as well are in, are in the same boat. And if we can account for that carbon and perhaps give credit for it or some some kind of accounting for, um, you know, for those vendors to encourage them to to think hard and, and look at the security um, uh, barriers and how to overcome those, um, we, we think we can go from, you know, a paltry less than 1% of, of drives are, are reused today to, to something in the tens of millions over time. Um, so that's that's a big part of this on the storage side, but but then again, you know, both both John Michael and myself are are more storage folks, um, but this this can also be extended to you know as we move forward, it'll be extended to more more and more you know more and more components in in the data center. So I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a question? Oh. So this is actually a pretty good. Uh, effort to start carbon accounting for circularity in general. Um, however, on the storage side, um, the biggest uh, blocker to reuse, uh, you know, everybody wants to reuse, there are millions of drives being shredded, like uh, just mentioned. And the biggest re uh, the biggest blocker is not um, making a case for reuse, uh, which is obvious. The biggest blocker is to ensure that the security is not compromised uh, for the storage devices, uh, especially when the user data is being stored on the data on the on the drive. And perhaps I speak on behalf of all companies. Uh, the biggest uh, concern people have, companies have, is uh, somehow that data it's not white. Oh, and yeah, and and and, co and companies have billion dollar contracts with the U.S. government too. So it's even even if you can get to a point where we're you know five, they, we've been told that five nines of 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 you know five nines is not good enough for security, and and it's it's not just security; it's perception. Um, I think one one avenue forward is cryptographic erase. Uh, be even then there are there are proposals coming out of the security group to add more transparency. Um, you know, you I don't, I don't know if folks here watched the security track, but there was there was um, presentations on safe, which is basically, you know, a third party aud auditing that's more transparent um, of firmware. Um, there was a presentation on having an open source block um, for um, for basically for cryptographic keys and, and how that works. Uh, again, adding more transparency. Um, one problem we have on the storage side is if there's even one bad player, and I, I think Microsoft brought up, um, I think these were SSDs, but between 2015 and 2019, there were Dutch researchers who found you know flaws in, in the implementation of cryptographic erase um, across you know, four different companies and eight, eight separate products. And and the the fact that that there's even any any um, any possibility of of cryptographic erase and sanitize overwrite for hard drives and block erase also have issues, you know, such as you know what happens with a bad block is is there some way um, is there some way a third party or a nation state with incredible resources could go and use optical equipment to to somehow grab bits that are in a bad block or or on a um you know there's 
there are events where you can write off track. And then when you do a sanitized overwrite, there's, there's data between the tracks that can't be accessed by the host, but might be accessed by some other area. So yeah, um, it's there, there's a lot of work going on um, and it's a long poll. Um, then again, there, there are some, you know, we also need to classify your data from, from low sensitivity to extremely high sensitivities as far as data exposure goes. All and right. There's room right. there. Uh, so yeah. you, I, I we just, have. Uh, so thanks. Uh, let me finish my thought process. Uh, so this is great. Uh, thanks for uh, informing us that this is a very critical element for circularity on the storage side, Eric. I think we should be addressing that. Yes. So DJ, I actually want yeah. to sync up with you because there is something that. I wanted to discuss about how we can address that part also, but like it's not taken, it's not gotten any push 